everybody, and welcome to the Dual Screens podcast, sponsored by Melted Pins and the Minds Behind the Adventure Games by Patrick Hickey Jr. I am one of your hosts, Stephen Fontana, and with me, as always, each and every single week, without fail, even when he has the flu, but he doesn't have it this week, it's Andy Asimakis. How are you, Andy? So McDonald's Japan just added a dessert called, called Otana Cream Pie. Mm-hmm. Which translates to adult cream pie. Interesting. So there's that. Now, that, that, I have so many questions. Like. I have so many questions. Do you? Yes. Could Is this the mean... the first one how soon we're going to Japan? Uh, to no. have an adult cream pie? Now, <laughs> does the marketing campaign spiff off of Odana from Richie Valens? I, I don't think the Japanese, the they don't think that way. Mm. I think it was just... Oh, Tana. Get your, get, your, oh, get your adult cream pies. Tana. Uh, and with us is uh, a, a man who I, before we started recording, could just, just was just destroying his name because I. You am weren't a stupid that idiot. bad. You um, weren't. Well, you are, but still. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> I am going to let him introduce himself and then so you could hear, compare, and contrast how you're supposed to say his name and how I destroy his name for the rest of the show. How are you? Hi, uh, I'm Gonçalo Monteiro, and uh, I'm from Portugal, Lisbon. And uh, yeah, well, that's Excellent. it. I'm here as a developer. <laughs> so my my terrible pronunciation is going to be Gonçalo, and I've heard and I've been told that that's okay. So that's what I'm going to say. So do not write me hate letters, everybody out there. Uh, welcome to the show, man. I appreciate you joining us. It's uh, we're very excited to have you on. Great. Um, for those of you that are new to the Dual Screens podcast, this is an interview show where Andy and I bring on an industry guest to tell us their story and whatever fun project they might be working on. Everyone in the gaming industry, be it a programmer, an artist, voice actor, whatever, they have a story to tell, and this is their platform to do so. The Dual Screens podcast posts each and every Thursday on your podcast service of choice, including iHeartRadio and Spotify, and you can also find us on YouTube, and of course, everything we do on DualScreens.com. Please, if you use Apple Podcasts, consider leaving us a review. It helps the show out tremendously. And if you leave us a, a review, we will read it out loud on the shows. And that's right. I said shows. Why? Because on this very feed, we also have other shows. On this same feed, every single Monday, we have the Dual Screens Gamescast, which is a new show that pits the best news from Nintendo, Sony, and Microsoft against each other and declares the biggest winners and losers. That posts, like I said, each and every Monday, but we also record that live on Sunday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern on twitch.tv slash dual screens streams. That's twitch.tv slash dual screen streams. And of course, we started at our first of our four seasonal shows. Um, so this is going to be running for the next seven, uh, uh, well, 14 weeks, really. It's every other week, and that's Andy Explains It All, a show where Andy uh, uh, explains a topic that he's very passionate about to me, who knows nothing about it. Um, and we just had our first episode. It was all about Stephen King. So it was a, re it was a really fun episode. And, of course, those are going to post every other Friday, uh, starting uh, this past Friday on the, uh, what was that, the 10th? I believe it was the 10th. Yep, it was the 10th. Um, you could support us on Patreon, which none of this is possible without you. So go to patreon.com slash NDS podcast, just like our Patreon producer, Colton, the apprentice Nestler. We cannot continue to grow. We cannot continue to take on more shows and we cannot continue to go to more events. Speaking of events, Andy, we did it. We got approval. Well, we made it. We are going back to PAX East, covering it as media. That's right. Dual screens is returning to PAX East. Uh, Boston, February 27th through, I believe, the 1st of March. March. 1st, yes. Mm -hmm. We will be there. We will be covering it. We are going to be interviewing. We're going to try and interview at least 10 more guests, more more uh, devs than we did last year. That's our goal. We want to really hit it and go crazy. I we think did last a year, lot last year, We too. did 29 last year. Yeah. So I want to beat that this year. I want to sure. do it. Let's I think we it. can. I think we can. Now Let's that we're well over 30, we'll, we'll, we'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So that's going to get us right into the show. Uh, let's just get let's just get right into it. Um, Gonzalo, uh, Gonzalo, um, who are you and, and where uh, what is this game you're working on? So Massive Galaxy came across uh, our 
uh, you know, Twitter sphere or whatever. It looks super interesting. And so we just kind of clicked around. We, we found you and we said, Hey, why don't you come on and tell us your story? So here you are. Uh, so what is massive galaxy and who are you? Well, massive galaxy is, um, it's a mixed genre. So it's a point and click adventure mixed with the uh, space trading games. So, uh, which means it's, uh, I try to mix between the classic point and click adventures, like, I don't know, Mac Island. Uh, I, I'm not remembering any more recent games, but uh, uh, the old uh, LucasArts games, uh, Sierra games, like Space Quest, and uh, I mix them with uh, Space Train, which means, I don't know, something like Space, uh, like Star Citizen or EVE mm-hmm. Online, where you can travel between systems. So, and everything with a pixel art look. Uh, so basically, I try to mix the, both genres, and uh, that's it. You, you're, you're a trader, you go on an adventure, but Apart from the single storyline, uh, you can also just travel around, trade, and fight uh, uh, along the systems that mm. you have available. So, so yeah, that's it. Massive Galaxy, basically, um, it's it's a it's a it's it's a bit hard to describe because it's not a traditional point and click. But at the right. core, it's it's a point and click adventure game with with more stuff, no, with exploration. No, you said that you could fight. Is that is that what you said? Yeah, yeah. There's okay. a part of with turn-based combat, uh, oh, which okay. means that uh, when you travel around, I have, I have well, you have to have that mechanic because if there's no drawbacks to trading, you just right. travel around and make millions. So, thing is, there's always a risk reward to it. So, mm. when you travel around, some things happen, and uh, yeah, uh, at the moment, I actually, I'm actually redesigning the the combat. Okay. So I'm trying to make it more interesting, and uh, and yeah, at the core, it's a point-and-click adventure with the space trading part, uh, and. Just to mention, I'm also developing a second game, uh, which is called For the Warp. I'm not sure if you heard about it. For the Warp? We, yeah, For the Warp. Uh, okay. it's, it's actually going to be released earlier because it's a more early access. It, it actually was a part of Massive Galaxy, to, to say the truth. So Massive Galaxy was, was slowly becoming bigger and bigger and uh, okay. actually removed uh, a small part of the Massive Galaxy and made, and made a standalone game. Yeah, so, I'm taking a look at it now. It looks it was we too got massive that galaxy. Yeah, so you got two <laughs> yeah games too massive. It, basically. <laughs> it was too massive. Yeah, it, it's it's one of the problem. I've been developing this for four years now, more than four years. So uh, the scope quickly has gone out of control. And uh, what I'm trying now is like closing the scope. Uh, I'm I'm I've separated the the other mini game and mix I mixed some card based mechanics. And create another uh, game uh, set in the same universe, but uh, yeah, I'm trying to release those two games. Wow. One each, one is much much smaller, which is for the warp, uh, and uh, yeah, Massive Galaxy is uh, a bit bigger. Now, and, uh, it's... are you a, are you doing this on your own? Uh, as a designer and, and, and coder, yes, yes. Uh, but I've got uh, art. I have an artist. You out uh, you outsource main... in some freelance. Yeah, yeah, or... basically. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most of the art is done is done by Kirkas, which is from Peru, mm. and uh, and uh, my main audio guy is from from the UK. So is this where is this where everything started for you, or did you come from some you know some other company, or did you do other projects before this? What was the life before Massive Galaxy? <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, I was a regular developer, web developer. I, I studied computer engineering and uh, worked for some years. Uh, I'm not that young. <laughs> uh, I'm already on my, on my, on my late 30s. <laughs> so, uh, oh, whoa, so, yeah. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What do you sounds mean? Sounds a lot like us. So, oh, hey, yeah, yeah, sure. Say, I know. I know. You are young. <laughs> some people, yeah, but people, some people expect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, that, that's the. That's the thing. Well, some people expect me to be like early 20s and. Uh, not true, but um, but yeah, uh, I've worked several years for companies and actually had the opportunity to make some um, casual games, just web games, uh, stuff like that. And I always wanted to make um, my own games. Uh, I started with web-based games back in 2009, mm. 2010, when when there was basically almost no indie scene. So yeah. and uh, with the indie scene th- stuff coming up, uh, uh, I. I started with Massive Galaxy, and uh, and yeah, I've I've made I've I've made several small games, or game jams, and stuff. But yeah, Massive Galaxy was supposedly the first commercial product. But I've separated the game, that little part, and made for the warp. So I'm gonna actually release both games, uh, hopefully this year. Um, so yeah, that's awesome. What um my background my background is basically programming. 
Cool. I would say. So how long were you, have you been in development of these two, well, I guess this whole project, this total project <laughs> of Massive Galaxy and For the yeah. World? Yeah, I started 2015. So I, uh, I started, I worked around two years while working on my main job. So mm. on weekends and and stuff. So, and uh, uh, starting 2017, I started almost full time. I still had, I still had some, I had some freelance jobs and um up until today so now i on the last i would say last year i've been mostly full time oh, i've nice. been savings because well because i i still have basically no no income from the games of course and uh so that's it i hopefully will release both games this year 2020 what uh what came first the name of the game or the name of the company i'm just curious <laughs> the game, the game, actually. You're like, game. I, I'm from the time when when people asked uh, what you're gonna game, uh, what are gonna name your studio, and uh, people back like in 2010, I think they said, I just named the, give the same name of the game of the first game. <laughs> so you're gonna save on marketing, and that's that's it. So actually, Massive Galaxy exists as an idea uh, since 2009 because it was supposed to be a web game, mm. and uh, I just well, it was of this. It was I never released it, and uh, I just kept the idea on my on the on the back. So and uh, well, I picked it up in 2015, and yeah, after four years, I'm still trying to finish it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, hold on, I'm doing I'm doing a trademark now for for the Warp Incorporated. So I'm gonna take that from you. <laughs> <laughs> really, I haven't I haven't I have I haven't really checked the latest <laughs> game, but but I, I don't. Uh, if I have problems, I'll just change your name. But... Yeah, you'll be fine. I'm so, sure. so you're you're making very. Um, I mean, these are obviously, they're, they're you said they're the same universe. Were these inspired by games you loved to play growing up, or was this just it just came to you out of the blue, like oh, I want to make a space adventure, whatever <laughs> universe. I, we are always influenced, of course. Uh, yeah, <laughs> the old point and click adventures, the the, the the like the trade game, the space trading games, like Elite. I don't know if the, the yeah, first ones. I'm sure. not talking yeah, yeah, about yeah. the more recent. Um, well, uh, even like if, uh, the, the game Freelancer. I don't know if you know. It's uh, it, it's a bit one. later. Yeah, from Microsoft. Microsoft, and um, yeah, those were the main inspirations uh, from games like Flashback. Another world, also because the the way the character looks and walks, it's more similar to those games like Flashback and Another World. And, uh, and while keeping, I think the, the main inspiration in terms of X the pixel ratio and, and scenario would be Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis, and um, which is uh, uh, I think the the, f- the second or third uh, Indiana Jones games uh, from LucasArts. Mm-hmm. And I really loved it. It was a big influence, uh, but more in terms of aesthetics, uh, uh, in terms of the, um, how the game should play. Uh, and then I was influenced by a lot of games, of course. It's not something you just came up with. And uh, For the War, for example, is, is very based on, on deck building games, uh, the board games and the latest games that have been released, like uh, Slay the Spire and others. And I just added the, what I add as a mini game on Massive Galaxy, mixed up the, those those mechanics and, uh, and made a standalone game, basically. So, yeah. What what allows you to go to commit to this as a full time project? <laughs> because you were saying how you just went over the last year, it's now a full time endeavor for you. Yeah. What what was the thing that made you say to yourself, okay, now I have this checklist that I have you know basically pulled off, and I can now go full time on this project. What was the trigger for that for you? Uh, well, what was the trigger? Well, first <laughs> the first. Well, first I, uh, um, well, uh, I just have to check the numbers if it's possible. I'm not going to just give up my job to to do this. Of course, right. uh, <laughs> if I have enough savings and uh, and uh, other factors, uh, and uh, well, basically I was just saving along these years, and I always had the, the idea to to make my own games, uh, and I quickly discovered that without full time, without working full time, um, I would probably would never finish most of these projects. So. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, the thing is, uh, I quickly discovered after two years that I either go full time or almost full time on these projects, or, or it's going to take a long time. I, I, it still took it still took a long time, but uh, but yeah, it's now more feasible to release games. And well, if they don't have any financial return, I'll just get back to the job market. 
And you haven't gone Instagram. through, you didn't go through any sort of crowdsourcing or anything like that to see if you can get some funding for this on, on your own, it's, it seems, right? Like this is just something you're looking to just get yeah. into early access and, tr- and maybe make a couple bucks from from that and then continue to, to improve the game. Is that is that your goal here? Yeah, well, f- the, the other game, the For the Warp, is clearly early access, but Massive Galaxy is not the time of game to be early access, so it's, it's different. So while For the Warp okay. is already re- really so niche as an early access and it's going to be on Steam on early access, uh, Massive Galaxy is going to be a final release, no... no I think it doesn't work for story games like that. Uh, so for the warp is more, um, it's more, it's more. Uh, most of the games, uh, deck building games, add that model. So uh, yeah, you, so, yeah. you need it for like balancing and stuff like that, and yeah, getting more feedback from the players and whatnot. Yeah, I I, I totally get that. Um, so I do want to ask you um, about developing video games in Portugal because we are. I mean, we're just we're in the states where it where everybody and their mothers making a video game in their basement and it seems like everybody <laughs> has their own story that of how they got into it and everything like that what's the what is the development development scene specifically the the triple a versus the indie video game development scene in portugal yeah well the thing with portugal is that it, there's basically no no gaming industry it's very small there are no Basically, no triple A's. Uh, there are some studios that do work for triple A's, and uh, but you can almost pick them by the hand. Like the whole country is like less than ten big companies uh, dedicated to to games, and uh, but the indie scene has grown up a lot, like in the last three four years. So we have uh, we have like uh, game game indie game events and. Uh, and well, the fact that we are in Europe, it's it's of course a lot easier to bring right. people from 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 Europe here, uh, and uh, and yeah, it's grown a lot the indie scene here, but it's still very small, and most people are doing games by their own. There's no 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 funding, even even the getting a publisher, it's very hard uh, mm. because they're they're not all good examples of, of uh, Portuguese indie developers g- getting. Uh, funding even from a publisher or something like that. So there are some good cases, but we still hadn't had a, a Hindi hit, I would say, or mm-hmm. a, a very good success. We had one or two companies that do make, um, for example, we have, we have a branch here from Miniclip, which is not a Portuguese company, but it, it's uh, most of the d- development team is here, but it's cool. not uh, a Portuguese-born company. So gotcha. yeah. It's still very early, so here the, the industry. Do you think it's um, just a a matter of it's a young industry there, or do you think that there are systems in place to make it more difficult for some reason? Oh, there, there's the lack of systems in place. <laughs> I would Got say. It. Okay. Because, for example, if you want funding, uh, there's like a boom here on tech companies. But if you're talking about games, forget about it. It's it's not gonna it's not gonna happen. So uh, wow, you there? There's definitely some information I could give you as to the the fact that video gaming is the biggest industry, entertainment industry yeah, on planet such Earth. Weird, yeah, such a people don't know the business. Yeah, the thing is, people don't know that about that. Even the government, I think that it doesn't recognize video games as as. Uh, as uh, like uh, something, uh, it doesn't recognize video games. That's it. Almost legitimate. Like it's it. just not legitimate. It sounds like my mom. <laughs> it's it's like yeah yeah it's like uh, they they don't they they don't even try to fit it on the tech part or if the entertainment part then it's there's, there's just no recognition. But I, I wouldn't say that would be the main problem. But uh, the, the the problem it happens everywhere. It's like most of us are indie developers, small small teams and so like everywhere else now it's even harder to 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 make a, a game sell so so yeah that's it i would say and and of course it's a matter of time i think there are companies more companies coming uh, we have a couple of good examples of companies uh, coming coming here to lisbon but it's still very early i would say go ahead andy no so what what would it take for the government to say hey this is a viable career path we should be investing in and taking seriously because you look all over the globe you can see success stories almost everywhere you go and gaming rakes in more money than movies movies film film, television and and music music combined yeah yeah but yeah, sure, but that's what we tell, try to tell. But the fact is that here in Portugal, um, I think the industry is very small, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's no local market. Basically, we are like a 10 million people 
country. So, uh, so there, so you're thinking there, you think that the issue might be that they're thinking on a national people in, in your country buying your product, as opposed to it being a global thing where you'd actually be yeah, yeah. out, you know, exporting your product across the, yeah, the yeah. world. That's interesting. Yeah. That, yeah. That would be, you know, there's several factors, but for example, while, while you have like most of the European countries, like Spain, UK, Germany, a lot of, um, funds a lot of uh, i would say associations uh, that help developers uh, there's nothing like that in portugal there are some things going on in the last couple of years but nothing that could even help financially any smaller developer mm. nothing like that i do think it will come up eventually but yeah not right now i would imagine that you and other indie devs are very close with each other given how the lack of support from like the overall, I guess, atmosphere in the country, and just knowing that your your career path isn't taken as seriously as it should be, I imagine. Yeah, it's it's a common it's a common theme around here, <laughs> developers. But yeah, sure. But well, to, to be fair, most of the people that want to, to to be successful, at least working for AAA, they have to go to another country. But but since it's, we are in Europe, it's very easy for for We'll just go to Spain or UK mm -hmm. or Germany or France to work. So I think that because any if anyone is even mildly successful, he, he can just hop off to another country in Europe, mm -hmm. and uh, that's what usually happens here. So so yeah, I would say that yeah. But uh, the, the the community is very cool. Uh, I think uh, every well, it's it's smaller, but um, everyone knows it's each other. So I think it's very. In that regard, we have a lot of positives about that. Yeah, that's nice. I, I like, feel like that. I feel like there's a lot of untapped potential there. Like you have a, a hotbed of creativity that's not given. They're not being fed. You know, like you're you're not you're not fostering this this environment, and so you're losing these creative people. I feel like like a big company like EA would be remiss to open up a you know a minor studio to do you know put out a couple of games every now and again. Like you you, you see it now. You see. You know, EA has expanded, Activision has expanded, Ubisoft has expanded. Um, maybe like Microsoft and, and Sony, not so much, but not, and maybe not Nintendo. But like some of those AAA publishers that don't also make their hardware, they're out there. They have smaller studios in more remote places. I feel like that would be, I feel like that would be an option to go to some place and say, hey, there's a lot of talented people here that unfortunately don't get the opportunity because of the way that the system is kind of set up for them. So they're all leaving to go other places. But what if we just kind of make a little a little studio here and, you know, maybe fund it from outside, not not rely on public funding or government help and just kind of, you know, set up camp with a little studio? I think that would be a pretty cool option. Has anybody tried to do that in the past? Is that anything you've ever heard of possibly happening anywhere else? Oh, it, uh, it's already happening. Uh, like one or two companies uh, have, have appeared uh, out of nowhere, I would say, here in oh. Lisbon. And uh, but uh, yeah, with some some funding. Uh, but mm. uh, but it's still very like you can pick uh, like two examples for last year. It's that's it. So yeah, we're a small country, but but uh, yeah, it's slowly becoming. I think I think the dream would be like a triple A, right. uh, creating a studio here, which would bring a lot of. I would say knowledgeable, knowledgeable people here, uh, right. because uh, as far as I know, like off of the very good developers uh, that wanted to work on games, mm. actually just left the country. It's the rea reality of it. But um, but yeah, I think th they are slowly coming. Uh, we are slowly having good examples. So it's not it's not something that doesn't exist. But you know, it kind of reminds me of the game development in New York City, actually. And I know that that might sound weird, but like New York City has. What is it? 14 million people, Andy? Something like that? Yeah, that sounds about right. Bar, like we have 14 million people, but there are no tax incentives for studios to do work here. So the only studio really that I could think of off the top of my head that that is here, and it's mostly, uh, it's not even like the ones that do the actual development work. It's mostly, I think it's the advertising and the like tax peop division and like, accounts payable whatever the hell it is but rockstar has has an office here but i don't think there's an ea or or anything else anywhere here uh not even in new jersey really most of the people go down to maryland or they go across you know to california 
or they're going to Toronto or uh, they're going to um, Oregon, but it's, it's very similar um, uh, to that. And, and I'm always wondering why doesn't the government put together incentives to, you know, whether it be tax incentives or grants or something like that, because there are so, so many people here that can make video games talented. I mean, it's New York city. It's right. one and of the it, art it, capitals of the world. And one of the tech capitals of the world, like, People are here, you know, but you there's no about, games being made. You think about the biggest success stories in indie gaming. Like a lot of stories come out of Montreal or Canada mm-hmm. or like Quebec. Yeah, Canada, there's yeah. huge, huge indie gaming scenes that the government just yeah. lends support to. And you don't hear a lot of like New York City based success stories, which is we've met a ton of developers here that are so passionate and hardworking, but they don't get their they don't get their dues, which is like I think it just sucks in a lot of ways. Yeah. I think yeah. I think there's a lot of yeah. If, if if I try to remember any New York developer, I can only think of one, which is an indie. It's uh, Wajetai. Uh, is a is a point click adventure creator. Um, uh, so apart from Wajetai, uh, I don't. I'm not. I'm not seeing any any New York I developers. I remember my buddy worked for. Um, I think they were. Oh, what the hell were they called? Chaos Studios. Uh, they were an. I th- they were the guys that made Homefront. Do you remember? Do you remember? I that do game? remember the game. Oh, those games. Yeah. The, there was the two oh, first-person shooters. Here for them. Yeah. They made. He he was on the team that made the first game, and then the second game was going so poorly they eventually like shut the studio and moved development somewhere else. Um, according to, uh, the uh, you know the internet, there are thirteen New York City gaming companies. Uh, there's Jack Pocket, never heard of it. Dots, never heard of it. Defiant Studios, apparently Zynga. Familiar. Oh, Zynga, yeah. Zynga is here. Riot Games, which I didn't know was here. I'm gonna look into that a little bit because that's weird. Um, Rockstar, like I said, Avalanche, and Dream Sale. Uh, there might be a couple more here, but I I don't know most of these. Oh, okay. Well, Dots does those that game Dots and Two Dots, the the mobile game. Defiant has no no games. They list no games. They were founded in 2016. Zynga, we know Zynga. Riot Dude, Games real. does League of Legends. <laughs> uh huh. But they're yeah, they're mostly the, headquartered in L.A. Are, yeah, their headquarters are not on on New York. Yeah. Yeah. Like Zynga, I think it's freaking valid, bro. Yeah, Rockstar. Uh, <laughs> I don't. I mean, Avalanche had, does Just Cause and Mad Max, so there, there's, there's a, you know, an actual studio. But what didn't they just close or get bought? Uh, whatever. But they're a Stockholm-based <laughs> uh, company. Uh, there's Dream Cell, which I've never heard of the game they made. Games for Change, uh, Hero Tainment, another game I've never heard of. Ink Stories, never heard of it. But, but. Oh, and and the Longtail Studios who made Rocksmith was New York City based. But even even so, I feel like New York City is a place where like EA, Activision, Ubisoft, Sony, Microsoft, you would Nintendo think, yeah, would be there in some way. Yeah. Right. And, and maybe maybe it's a thing of like it's it's probably expensive in New York in yeah. terms of, of at the office. And uh so that that I think Portugal would be exactly the opposite regarding that. But uh, uh, yeah, I think it's more like Culture like Silicon Valley has a lot of debt for for tech companies, and I think New York ends up not not having so much of that. Mm. So, tell us, Gonzal, why 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 is Massive Galaxy going to be the game that's going to make Portugal recognize how awesome <laughs> games are? <laughs> give, us, give us like give us the play by play. Well, it's, I, I don't think I have an answer for that <laughs> because it's like uh, like the big question. Yeah, who's gonna who's gonna gonna going to put Portugal on the map? Uh, I'm not sure if any indie is gonna have gonna make it. I would need we would need like a big studio branch or something like that because even a uh, indie, it, I'm not sure it's, it's gonna push the industry for, forward. It's not one or two guys even getting a very big. Uh, success uh, it's not going to change much to be fair so yeah it's not it's not on my hands i think but yeah who knows in 5 or 10 years we we can change the the scene here you just need a pubg that's all a simple pubg oh, or yeah. minecraft yeah. and everything will be fine 
So yeah, can you like kind of walk us through like a typical mission in Massive Galaxy? Because I'm reading up right now how you can be like a smuggler or a spy or just be a pirate. That's what I would be. So yeah. what's like the level of freedom you have in this game in terms of how you can approach missions? Yeah, um, well, it's not, it depends. When you start the story, you have like, the storyline is very similar. It's like the same when you start, but uh, uh, after the first or second decision, you are you basically unlock the travel. So you just can travel around and it's up to you really. Uh, you can take up some missions which are not story, uh, story based and missions are basically delivery stuff. And um, there are some opportunities for you to do illegal missions, and that, that's it. There's no, there's no. I don't have any. How do you say? Um, moral system, ethics system. That sounds like, like my kind of game right there. Mm, no, <laughs> a game without morals or ethics. <laughs> yeah, I don't. It's not. It, maybe on the storyline, depending on your choices, the the, the storyline, the part that the story is written. Uh, that may have some repercussions, some decisions. But apart from that, you can just trade around and uh, instead of instead of a trading with with a cargo you can just steal it or attack it or something like that yeah uh, but i think the the focus of the game is not i don't think the focus is on the the multiple jobs you can have it's more i think the, the main focus would be just on the trading and on the storyline which has a branching story which is i think would be the the biggest part of the game but but yeah I don't have many. You don't. You, you just. You don't. I don't have any decision with which you just say. Oh, I'm going to be a trader and just trade around. I don't think it's the, the kind of game which you choose a, a specific profession and just stick to it. Are there so, like crews and stuff that you like recruit? Is it, is it something like that, or are you just kind of by yourself? Yeah. Well, the the, the part of the storyline you do recruit uh, a team to do the storyline part, but the 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 the, the part trading part of the game and, and combat doesn't have any uh, any crew uh, part about it. Gotcha. Just, just the storyline. So it sounds like I could be a total asshole and it's not going to matter. And I'm very excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, not, you'll make some enemies, I, to I would some imagine. Extent. Yeah. But I think for the most part, I can just rob people and go about my merry way. That's, a, yeah, that's, well, that's what I'm getting. <laughs> you can have problems with the police. With the police, uh, there, there's a specific faction i would say that, that acts as, as the police so in the main systems uh, you'd have some problems with that but uh, it's not something that you focus on the game it's not like on eve online which is you have uh, like several factions and security zones mm. uh it's not it would be fun but i don't have i would probably not have the time to to add all the all of those details to the game so uh yeah it's more it's more open-ended can i that. can i rob the police <laughs> well, if, well, no, you cannot rob the police. You can only fight or run. So, you either destroy the police ship and get some car, get some scraps, or yeah, it's not that. Oh, um, Andy's gonna run. He's a coward. He's gonna run from them. No, I'll fight. I'll <laughs> definitely fight. <laughs> I don't know about that. So you were saying how you rework the combat system? Yeah, um, it's like from the previous. Time. So, what was the? first iteration compared to what it looks like today yeah the first iteration i wanted to do basically i want to do a very simple system with basically like like the pokemon system of mm -hmm. fighting very simple just two actions and the thing is since you only have one ship i i, I found it very boring basically yeah. i don't have i would have to add more stuff to make it interesting so i switched to another system which looks like more like uh, RPG uh, like a Japanese RPG type type of combat and uh, and uh, this third iteration I'm trying to mix something from for the warp which is the other game which is just card based it's quite different and I'm trying to make it uh, less random more which you you have more more time to 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 pick your your attack it's not going to be card based but uh, it's it's going to be something between what would be a card-based game with very fixed uh, stats of your attack and defense, and uh, and with uh, like Final Fantasy type of games, so something like that. I'm still deciding on that. It's going to be probably redesigned. I will probably redesign the, the whole stuff in the following months. So, so it's so yeah, it's still it's probably one of the last things I'm, I'm finishing. On the game. So Stephen, headline here: 
Portugal thinks Pokemon is boring. Let's get that Got out it. there. Let's type possible. that up real quick. So on there really All quick. of Portugal thinks Pokemon is boring. No, no, no. I, I, no. <laughs> it's my, it's my personal opinion because uh, I, I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not from the Pokemon generation. I would say, but I try to implement something simple. Uh, but it uh, because because well, Pokemon. We have several Pokemons, and on my game we have one ship. So the thing, the the tech. And uh, the tech thing, it's, it becomes very boring with just two, two options. So uh, two or three options, it doesn't yeah, work. So. A little mundane. Just keep hitting the same button and see what happens. Uh, you know, there are some people who just train a Pokemon with a very powerful move and then just keep pressing the A button and just win every fight. So I get <laughs> yeah, it. I get it. Yeah, Even with the 800 Pokemon, it could still be a little mundane and boring. Um, oh, so- I, just, I, I just walk mine out with the Pokeball now. <laughs> So, I, I do no real work to get to we level up the Pokemon at this point. You just get your steps in. <laughs> you get the stack, get those KMs in, baby. <laughs> <Nice>. <sighs> yeah. So, so you're gonna go uh, as we mentioned. You're gonna do for the warp that that right now is uh, it has a planned release date sometime in in 2020. You said you're gonna try and do that. Uh, yeah, it's both games. Yeah, it's both yeah. Games. yeah. For the warp, for the warp is already released on each as an alpha because it's a early access kind of game okay. so it's gonna be released very soon on steam on early access like okay. in february, february if everything goes cool according to plan but massive galaxies take a bit longer because it's more story heavy a lot of scripting a lot of dialogues right so um and actually i had to rewrite a lot of stuff last year so so they're so... in they're in the same part in the pun massive galaxy um are they tied story-wise in any way or is it just because they're just in the same universe yeah it's kind of they're the same universe uh for the war would be a prequel but it's it's not supposed to have mm. the same characters you're not gonna meet the characters but you're gonna meet some of the backstory i would say uh and you're gonna meet the same species for example the the couple of aliens are uh, also appear on, on both games um and uh yeah yeah, I'm, I basically use the same universe. It would be easier for me. Also, I use the same pixel artists, which 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 means that I think it it fits. It fits making the yeah both games on the universe. Yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. like an awesome feeling. I feel to come to the point where it's like I can make two games out of this. This is just genius right now. <laughs> well, it's it's well, it's a lot harder because well, I'm just one guy uh, as a programmer and designer. True. So. You so actually, actually, basically, at this point, <laughs> separating the game is actually actually delayed both games. So, of course, but uh, mm. well, I'm trying to to go with it. Taking a look at the uh, all the different uh, sprite work and all that stuff, it looks really cool. Yeah. So really, why really why why did you land on pixel art for the aesthetic for this? Because I'm a huge lover of sprites. That's why I was kind of drawn to this game, to be honest. Anything with sprite work or pixels, I just fall in love with automatically. Um, but why did you decide to pick this when designing these games? Well, actually, I I loved like um, I was looking for cyberpunk and pixel art stuff back back in the day, and uh, uh, I've I've saw a couple of artists do that, which nowadays they are very popular now. I even mm-hmm. even more popular now, and actually some of them are actually doing cyberpunk games with pixel art. Uh, after I've I've started, so I immediately knew there was something there that I really liked, and uh, even even the pixel ratio and uh, all the the style, I, I quickly learned that uh, I really wanted to make the, the kind of space uh, game uh, with a lot of planets and scenarios with the with the, the that sort of st- style pixel art style. And of course, I knew it would be possible if I did it in three D or something like that. It would be even bigger scope. Uh, but what I discovered is that even with pixel art, it's, it's a lot of work to make. Uh, like I have like more than twenty backgrounds, different backgrounds, and uh, several animations, etc. So it's still a lot of work. That's why that's why it took so so much time. And uh, but yeah, I basically already love pixel art, and uh, and I keep kept falling in love with the, with the, with the, all the art styles and scenarios and of course a lot of the inspiration comes from science fiction uh from books etc and i just try to replicate those ideas the things that i haven't seen on games uh with uh, but in pixel art form i would say and 
And that's what I'm trying to do with Mass Effect Alex. Yeah, it just looks like a beautiful game because it's easy to dismiss the, like, oh, you're, you're trying to get the nostalgia factor in with the retro sprites, but you can tell that a lot of, there's a lot of passion in this project looking at it. It's not just kind of thrown together just to cash in on, you know, a trend from years ago. It's a lot of heart is in this, and you can tell by the animations and the level of detail, and it, it just looks fantastic. Yeah, I think it's mostly, I played some games and saw saw some, like, for example, I saw a lot of, uh, I, would, I would say, like, alien landscapes and stuff like that from a lot of artists. And the thing is, like, I wanted to play a game like this and travel around several planets, uh, travel around the galaxy, see all, seeing all these beautiful scenery, but with pixel art. And that was, I think, the main core idea that I wanted to 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 bring to the game. And then I just build everything else up from there. So it's it's mostly passion project. <laughs> it's not a. I don't think someone just starts developing a, a game knowing that it's gonna take years. Just think it's gonna cash in on some trends. I don't think pixel art is a trend. I think it was some years ago when the first indie game started. But I think it's mm-hmm. a, it's a style. It's a different style of art, and uh, it's gonna it's gonna stay here. It's not. Something. Yeah, I think most gamers nowadays can kind of tell when it's being used for the right reasons. Because you can, you can, you can kind of see like when it's being used as, oh, a quick, like, oh, it's sprites, but there's no real heart to what you're seeing on the screen. Mm-hmm. There's no, there's no like, the effort's just not there. But when you look at a game like this, you can tell that it's every little pixel was put there for a very specific reason. And it looks just like yeah, that, it, the, the end result matters to you and the artist. That's the definition of pixel. standard, yeah. Every pixel counts, and uh, it depends, of course, the the the, the style of the artist. Uh, but but yeah, but even so, it's not. Uh, people think pixel art is easy. Uh, that oh, people definitely went. not. But the fact is that if I do a three D model, it might take me some time. But after that, I can just animate it and see use all the angles. And with pixel art, each time I want to do that, it's going to take a lot of more work. And right. if I do it. Bigger the resolution, which something that happened on for the warp. I have increased the resolution mainly because of the UI. But if you have a background with with double the the width on resolution, it's four times the work. And if you add frames, it's going to be even harder. So it's not something that um, it doesn't scale. Pixel art doesn't scale like 3D. So it's yeah. after while it's going to take more work and more money inevitably um, to do uh, a very detailed pixel art animation, for example. You can tell, like, there are some games that use, like, asset stores and just buy, you know, pixel assets and manipulate them and kind of, there's some game. I don't want, I'm not going to name games, but there are some games where the, where the different objects or the background and the foreground and the, char- or the main character and the enemies, they don't have the same color palette sometimes. They don't have the same style. Uh, they're kind of like a mix, a, a mishmash of, of different things. Um, but you know, massive galaxy here. I mean, it all looks like it's coming. It's part of the same, uh, brush stroke as it were, everything kind of fits together. Um, in it's cohesive artistic story, visual story that it's telling here, which is really, really nice. Yeah. Well, it's, it's all original art. Of course, there's nothing bought out. Everything is made and by, well, mostly by Kirkazim. I've got a lot of other, uh, I made some art, some of the smaller stuff, not much. But uh, and uh, for Massive Galaxy, I also had a second pixel artist that did like three or four backgrounds, not much. Mostly it's just Kirukazi, of course. And uh, yeah, it's everything is original, so everything is planned out for uh, design. And well, yeah. So if all things go as planned, when can we expect these games to drop? Okay, uh, <laughs> it's, it's it's a very hard question. Well. Um, <laughs> I think because of the ways things are going, and I'm I'm wasting a bit of more time than I, than I was thinking with with the, the second game. I think it's gonna be uh, during the summer. We'll okay. see how. Uh, I'm I'm trying to if 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 the delay is gonna be bigger, I'm trying to maybe release a demo or something like that. Something like which you, you can already see part of the the game a bit a little bit of the game uh, because there's a lot a lot of game that you can play already. 
and it's and taking so much so many years not and not showing that uh, it takes well it, I, I really like to to release something before the the final launch some demo or something like that mm-hmm. and uh, yeah maybe during the summer to be realistic late summer august september maybe cool but i promise now nothing that's not <laughs> All right, you heard it here first, and write it down, and hold them to it. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I've already failed that several times because I actually <laughs> one of the plans was to release on 2018, and I actually have some trailers that say that year still, and I actually I I've, I don't I have no idea what to do with that, and I, if I bring those trailers down and put some up with the correct dates, but but yeah, I have some trailers that show 2018, so yeah. I've already two years behind schedule. Listen, if you were a Kickstarter campaign, it'd be a whole different conversation we have right now. You can set your own internal dates and push them back as long as you need to. No one's been yelling at you for like a refund. So I think you're fine. Take as long, yeah, one, much time as you need. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the things that I, I thought about. when Because I, I in 2016, I was planning to do Kickstarter. But uh, I discovered two things. That if you stick to a date... Yeah, it's going to be hard. And uh, the thing is, doing a Kickstarter in itself, it's a lot of work. It's months and months that you're going to lose uh, just creating and marketing a, a Kickstarter campaign. So, so yeah. I'm, I, I, for example, I, I, I looked for a publisher some years ago, but at the moment, I'm, I'm, always, I'm almost already finished with the game. So I'm no longer looking for a publisher, at least for the PC. So, yeah. I don't have any any, uh, I would say financial ties or or promises related to to release dates. Uh, are consoles in your future, or are you just aiming at PC for the time being for the initial release? Well, PC at the moment. Uh, mm-hmm. Consoles, if I do a port, maybe Switch. I'm not sure, but it will take quite time to mm-hmm. release a port. Mm-hmm. It's not going to be easy. So yeah, just PC for now. I'm not promising any ports. Excellent. And do you have any more questions before we get into uh, our rapid fire? Oh, I have some fun rapid fire questions, so let's get into that as soon as possible. All right. <laughs> Let me tell you about our sponsors. Uh, this week, we have Melted Pins, uh, we, as we have had for the last few months here. Uh, if you don't know what Melted Pins is, that is original tattoo art-inspired pins, buttons, uh, canvas bags, stickers, all sorts of things by artist Kelsey Lynn, who has done art for our podcast, has done art for websites and other podcasts all over the world, it makes really, really interesting stuff. And if you want to support a uh, a small business and, and a true artist, then go to meltedpins.com. And if you find something you like, put it in the uh, in the little the little the little cart there, and then you have a code that you can put in. And you ready? I'm gonna whisper that code. It's NDS Melted. I didn't whisper it because I want you to know it. It's NDS Melted, and that's going to get you 10% off of your purchase. That's right. You can buy some really cool 100% original designs that, you know what? You wear it to school. Like if you're, if you're, if you're, in, if you're in school, you wear it to school, they're going to be like, whoa, what is that? I've never seen that before. And you're going to be like, you're damn right you never saw it before. Why? Because it's all, all original. It's 100% original. Kelsey Lynn, before she takes over the world and she starts making art for everyone all over the, all over the planet, you get in there, ground level, meltedpins.com, NDS melted, 10% off your purchase. And we are also sponsored by Patrick Hickey Jr.'s The Mind Behind the Adventure Games. This is a fantastic book. We've had Patrick on the show uh, uh, once for Patreon exclusive and once for the show proper. And he will be returning soon to tell us about this game, but or this book. So... The Minds Behind the Adventure Game are interviews with the cult and classic video game developers. Um, it's featuring interviews with over 30, with, with 31, excuse me, popular video games, including Grand Theft Auto, Strider, Maximum Carnage, and even Pitfall. Okay, This book gives you a behind-the-scenes look at all of the origins of these games, the people who made them. It, it, these these are fantastic behind the scenes stories. Sometimes you will your jaw will be on the floor about how some of these games were made. How some of the biggest games that you could think of from the eighties and nineties were basically made in a you know bedroom with three people who are putting their entire life savings in, into something, and then it becomes 
you know, something like Strider or, or, or Pitfall or something like that. So you never know uh, the different kinds of stories you're going to get here. And if you want to purchase this book, you could do in two places. you got PatrickHickeyJr.com and you also have Amazon. If you buy it from, from Patrick's website directly, he will personally autograph every single copy and send it to your home. It's pretty awesome. He's a pretty good dude. This is the second book he's done. He's also done The Minds Behind the the, uh, the Games, which is a you know general, and he's also got other ones in the works. I believe he's got a shooter's game, and he's got a sports game that he's announced as well, uh, a sports book and a, and a shooter book. So, yeah, check that stuff out, and let them know uh, that uh, the boys at Dual Screen sent you. All right? Do that. All right, Andy, it's time for rapid-fire questions. Yes, it is. This... <laughs> is where we get to get to know Gonzalo a little bit better, where we are going to just ask him the things that come to our brain, things we want to know, the, the burning questions. This will determine if we bring him back on the show or not. Understood. <laughs> this is the make or break part of the show for the guest. Yes. Interesting. <laughs> Andy, would you like to start us off? I think you should with the, with the, with with the, the first okay. and always, yes. The first question and always the first question, Gonzalo. Pineapple on pizza, yes or no? Yes. Wow, Andy, you suck. You are so bad, Andy. Shut, shut up. That's eight for eight, bud. Sh- shut up. <laughs> <laughs> if if you could disinvent one thing, what would it be? Wow, that's a good question, Andy. Wow. <laughs> I came prepared this <laughs> I'm going to crack open a drink for that one. Yeah, you should. Well... I, I I'm only thinking of one thing right now, game related, Fortnite. <laughs> <laughs> That's your headline. <laughs> I love it. Can Fortnite please go away? An in interview. Um, all right, I like it. What is your favorite cheese? My favorite cheese. Um, the uh, I'm not remembering the name. The the very the very. Uh, I would say the um, the butter like cheese. Uh, I'm not sure. the camem something. Yeah, camembert. Camembert. Yeah, yep, yep. Camembert. Yeah, that's a good yeah, one. Yeah, that, that one. That one. If you were a pair of shoes, what kind of shoes would you be? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. Pair of slippers. <laughs> All right. That sounds very cozy. Well, well very... I've been working on uh, mostly on the past three years. So. Some fuzzy slippers, just kind of chill out for a little bit. Do you like, like do you like warm weather or do you like cold weather? Warm weather. Mm. What was the best thing before sliced bread? Mm. You know the phrase, this is the best thing since yeah, sliced yeah. bread. What were they yeah. saying before sliced bread came around? Well, in Portugal we don't have that say. We do know that say uh, actually. But is there a similar yeah, thing in Portugal? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not. If something related to that. I'm not. Not remembering anything. Hmm. We we have the same. We have the, exactly the same say uh, translated. Uh, but I think it was influenced by, of course, the American say. But uh, I'm not remembering anything like that. Hmm. Ah, I would say bread. <laughs> Ah, is stupid... <laughs> this is that is very smart. That's an answer. That is a That's practical a man. See, we've learned something about you. You think logically. Mm-hmm. If, if <laughs> sliced know, pineapple bread on, was pineapple the best on, thing, I bought pizza. That's uh, you know how I feel about that. Well, answer. you're an idiot. <laughs> uh, favorite American movie? Uh yeah, Fight Club. Ooh, Ooh your cool comeback on the show. That's a good I love one. you. I, I love you more than I did five minutes ago. Okay, <laughs> take a good look in the room you're sitting in right now. Yeah, how many pennies would you fit in that room? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know the size of an American penny. I do have the. I do know the size of a euro euro cents, which is how many euro equivalent. cents could you fit in that room? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have no idea because because actually I, I'm on the attic of my house, oh. which is uh, where I, I I put up my the place where I work, and uh, it's it's because if it's the attic, it's quite large, uh, because it's just the upper part of the house. So mm. yeah, if I only count the part where I work, there's a small separation. I would say mm. it's not that large. Like, oh, I'm gonna say meters. Do you know how what is a meter? Sure, we can figure it out. Yeah, yeah. why not? We'll learn. <laughs> It's four by three meters, so 
Yeah. Oh, that's a, that's a pretty big room. That's not, yeah, that's it's, not too small. Yeah, it's not that small. It would fit uh, quite a lot, but only so, recently. So a lot because, uh, would be the answer to that question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I moved last year, so I lived on a small apartment. It wouldn't fit much where I was back then. Ha- this is going to be a two-parter question here. Um, have you ever been to the United States? No. Okay. If you were to go to the United States, wh- what city is or, or town or state would you want to visit first? First, New York, yeah. without a doubt. Oh, he's going to come see us, obviously. Yeah. First stop. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> who knows? Who knows? <laughs> um, we're, we're New York City's greatest export. We are. Something. <laughs> I don't think we've ever been exported. Happy yeah. Andy. <laughs> no, this podcast uh, has right. a yep. known following. Actually, we do. All, yeah. All, yeah, in the UK and all over Spain. So yeah, that, that's okay. a fact. That's a true fact. Um, would you rather look like a potato or feel like a potato? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, just a potato, not a fried potato, or yeah, just, just a potato. A, pl- a potato plucked out of the pl- earth, potato. Yeah, it's oh, come ground. on, they feel horrible. <laughs> no, that that's that's the question. Would you rather feel oh. like one or look like one? <laughs> I, I would rather feel like one. Okay, look like one. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. I guess. That's that, a question. That makes sense. Oh, that's horrible. Um, uh, is is breakfast cereal a soup? <laughs> Is the soup? Oh, come on! Is cereal and milk soup? It kind of looks like, if you think about it, it doesn't taste like soup. Yeah, <laughs> you could say it's soup if you just ignore the Logic. fact that it's milk. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Well, technically, it's it's something floating in the liquid, <laughs> but it's mostly water. So I would say it may, maybe. <laughs> I wouldn't say no. <laughs> what what do you think about when you're alone interesting that's a very deep question that's not a rapid fire there andy well you know it's we can get deep a little bit it's getting to know we are we're getting to know uh, our guest yeah. well first i would say game ideas would be the first the mm-hmm, first thing mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. and uh, the second would be traveling i think <laughs> but yeah to new york mm-hmm. obviously New York, yeah, <laughs> not, yeah. Necessarily, not necessarily the the first, but yeah, sure. <laughs> what is where's the first place you would want to travel if you could just pack your bag and leave tomorrow? Where's tomorrow. the first place you're going? Uh, I don't know, probably somewhere on S- Southeast Asia or Japan Ooh. or something like that. Ooh, Japan for sure. It's a great country. That's on my bucket list. I'd like to go to Japan. Yeah. We should. Uh, Tokyo uh, actually, I, I went. My first country outside of Europe was Japan. Oh, I went there awesome. some some years ago. Yeah, I, I'd love to get back there. Actually, when when things break, do you prefer to fix them or replace them? Well, what what are you thinking about? Software or hardware? Hardware as in art stuff, because it's it's a different answer. For software, I think I always fix. But for hardware, yeah, it's replace. I'm not that good fixing mm. stuff, hmm. physical stuff. Interesting. Yes. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Nice. Yep. Need that jitter. Describe yourself with one word. <laughs> <laughs> with one word, I have an idea. Hmm. Ah, come on. No. One word. Sorry. I, come on, I, you the, can do it. Yeah, the, the, I think the, the only answer I can come up with that, that could be interpreted in seriously bad ways. So I'm sorry. I, I, I have no. I have well, no you got to say it now. You can't. Just, <laughs> I don't know. Can't walk I, it back. <laughs> yeah, I think the only one would be okay. <laughs> okay. Which is okay. I am. I am okay. Uh, See, that can mean many things. It can mean that you find yourself to be moderately attractive, maybe not the most attractive. Also, that your mental state is that you are fine. You're okay. You're not panicking and you're not ready to crumble and you're also not the greatest mood in the world. You're okay. You're middle ground. I like it. I like it. I think that's a fair answer. Um, French fries or tater tots? And if you don't know what tater tots are. I don't know. 
Oh man, I don't know what that is. French fries or potato chips? <sighs> Come on, potato chips. Okay, yeah. I would prefer French fries. Yeah, yeah, yeah me too. We got time for if, a couple more, Andy. All right. If life was a video game, what would the first cheat code be that you would use? Uh, I would give, I would use, uh, I think I still remember one from Doom when I was a kid. <laughs> it's IDDQD. And uh, I think it even gives you invincibility or, or no clip. I'm not sure. So you go for God mode, essentially. Yeah, something, yeah, something like that. <laughs> it, it's much easier. But uh, yeah, let me just check on the web. IDDQ. It's always the thing I remember about cheat codes, IDDQD. Uh, cheat code, uh, God mode. Yeah, that's it. God mode. I like it. I, I would always do the uh, the Sims monies code. Just spam that shit. It was at $60,000 every time you hit it. Yeah. I think that's a <laughs> good segue do. for the next obvious question, Stephen. Yeah, but, but actually, after oh, yeah. after after God mode, I would prefer no clip. No clip is great. Mm -hmm. No clip is great because yeah, you could go anywhere. So stopping. okay, so go anywhere. Interesting. So here's a very very interesting question that we've asked all of our guests: invisibility or flight? Which oh, power flight. would you rather have? Flight. See? Flight. Yeah, I dream of flying a lot. <laughs> so yeah, flight. Do you, you find there's any sort of moral conundrum with the power of invinci invisibility? Uh, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would say so. That's not the question, though. <laughs> <laughs> We're not debating the moral aspects of the question. <laughs> yeah, no, no, but I think flight would be much better. But yeah, even flight can, can give moral issues. But yeah, invis invisibility does, of course. I think anyone that picks invisibility is, is thinking about some, some things. So. Mm -hmm. exactly. Right, but God mode wouldn't, though. Well, that's just yeah, you know, well, protecting oneself from imminent death. That's all that is. Yeah, God mode does kind of solve everything that you want, yeah. like the money thing, the whatever. Flying, can help a lot so of people. I... Listen, if I was invisible, I wouldn't think I was a god. If I had something called God mode, I would think I was a a god. <laughs> would you that's be Would you be a virtuous god, or would you be a vengeful god, Andy? I would be a a god of balance. Mm. Mm -hmm. so so you're thanos is what you're saying you just want to snap half the universe i didn't say that <laughs> i would be a righteous god a fair god interesting yeah interesting um, all right all right um, so yeah you get one you get yours and then we'll do the final right. one would you rather have a third eye or a third arm Uh, can I can I ask you a question? Why would I need a third eye? Is there any advantages to that? Is it a special eye? Do you want to go with, you go with the classic definition of a third eye? That it like is connected somehow to your soul or yeah, something like that? Yeah, like, that something like talking? mystical mystical stuff. Yeah, I would prefer a third eye. Yeah. Uh, because a third arm, I'm not sure where I would put it. <laughs> now, do you, do you I'm, nervous, I'm do nervous about where it comes out of. I was going to say, as a, as a programmer, having a third arm might come in handy. Yeah. Clickety yeah, yeah. clackety, make more, you know, uh, make more happen. Uh, okay. do, you, do you wear glasses? Uh, yeah, at home, yes. I was going to glasses outside. A funky pair of glasses you have to buy now with your third eye. Nah, you just, you're not, I mean, <laughs> there's no guarantee that the third eye is also going to be, have some sort of degenerative property. It does. <laughs> So, so it's a so mystical, you, de degenerative. I see souls. I see. It's a mystical souls. eye that's also farsighted. I see very, very blurry souls. Right. I see the, the very blurry future and past. <laughs> and the final well, question. I, I, I want to say, Gonzalo, coming on this podcast, your future is most certainly a little more blurry than it was <laughs> an hour ago. <laughs> But yes, the final question. Yes, the final question. And as per tradition, eight devs have, you will be the eighth uh, guest to have been asked this question. And it is a very deep and thoughtful question. So please do not rush to your answer because the answer can make or break your whole career. Wow. Andy or Steven? <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I barely know you. Exactly. <laughs> First impressions, most important impressions. Yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately, 
I talked first with Andy, and Understood. then you. Understood. And I know more you in terms of image because I haven't seen Andy's face, right. of course. Right. Uh, but the thing is, uh, yeah, I, I don't have any preference really. But uh, probably the first one, Andy. So wow. I would pick Andy. Congratulations! Sorry, congratulations, Andy. That's your first Congrats. clear victory. Oh, um, but in terms of just just to say, uh, if I wanted to think more about it, I think Stephen is more. Uh, I, I'm sorry if I mix. Stephen, you're the guy with two kids, right? Yes. Okay, I have, I have one daughter, also five years old. So um, I would pick you, but yeah, uh, on first on the first decision, I would I'd pick Andy. I'm not sure. I, I like your explanation. I, I believe it. I I think that. Uh... He's trying to soften the blow. No, no, no. The, the answer really here is clear. The answer is that if I spoke to him first, he would have no question, but but he would say me immediately because he wants to say me now, but he's afraid no, he to doesn't. hurt your feelings. No, he doesn't. So, <laughs> <laughs> No, the thing is, I probably know more about Stephen's life because I have some similar stuff regarding it. Right, and that's a little like your life. Stuff. That's, 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 who wants Sympathy. that? Yeah, I get See, it. I'm a more sympathy, but character. yeah, but uh, yeah, I have a lot more to offer you. Did you just say you. Mo more character or more moral character? We're not talking about morals I right was, now. Yeah, I was gonna say that's not true at all. Um, all right, that is gonna bring <laughs> us to the end of the show. Gonzalo, you are absolutely fantastic. We love having you on the show. Uh, we look Thank forward you. to uh, you know continuing this friendship throughout your uh, your career. If you ever do come to New York City, you know where to look. We are here. We will hang out. We will take you out for a drink. Um, right. All right. So let's uh, let's get right into the uh, the little uh, rigmarole here at the end. If you want to follow this show on social media or our whole website on social media, you could do so. We are at NDS Podcast on Twitter and Instagram. I am at Batchild27. Andy is at Pantsguy. And if you want to join our Facebook group, that's Facebook.com slash groups slash dual screens podcasts. That's facebook.com slash group slash dual screens podcast. You could also go to facebook.com slash dual screens. And that's our kind of company page where you will see a bunch of our stuff get, get posted there as well. But if you want to just hang out with each other, uh, the group, uh, the Facebook group there, uh, dual screens podcasts is, uh, is the group for you. And, uh, you, uh, if you want to follow Gonsol and, and everything there, that's, uh, at massive galaxy on on twitter uh is there anywhere else you want people to follow you there's facebook.com slash massive galaxy massive galaxy.com is there anywhere else you want people to follow you and follow the progress of the game if you want to wish list uh, both games are are on uh, steam uh you can just search massive galaxy on steam or for the warp uh and yeah mostly on twitter uh i'm not very active on, on facebook but yeah okay. I, I do post some stuff there awesome um, and folks, if you want to watch our our uh, Twitch channel, we do stream a couple days a week. That's at twitch.tv slash dual screen streams, twitch.tv slash dual screens streams. If you want to buy some of our, our merchandise, you could do so at teespring.com slash stores slash dual screens shop. That's teespring.com slash stores slash dual screen shop. And of course, all of these links are going to be in the show description. Um, our theme song, Retro Chatter, is by Bradley Parsons at Sound at uh, Train Sound Studio. Sorry, and uh, Andrew Douglas, uh, who does all of our uh, podcast cartoon art and whatnot. Uh, you could follow him on social media at Angie Moto. And uh, thank you, of course, to Matt Murray, who is our one, a contributing editor and contributing artist to the podcast as well. And folks. If you want to support us one more time, I'm going to give you that that Patreon. That's patreon.com slash NDS podcast. We need your help because we are going to PAX. We just basically drain the account so that we can get to PAX. But now we want to have better equipment while we're at PAX. So if you can support us for as little as $1, that gets you into our VIP Discord channel where you can chat with us each other and also our indie dev guests who hang out in there throughout the day periodically to chat and talk about the the gaming news and all that fun stuff you also get a bonus episode each and every month in which you vote the topic there's also a three dollar tier a five dollar tier a ten dollar tier a twenty five dollar tier and then a fifty dollar tier and the fifty dollar tier of course is our patreon producer and we want to thank you again colton the apprentice nestler that's it this has been yet another exciting installment of the Dual Screens Podcast. Andy, is there anything yes. you want to tell our listeners before we go? I could announce next week's guest. Yes, please week. do. We're having on Neon Deity Games, talking about Junk Puncher, which looks like an amazing NES game. Mm. 
Like if you played Shatterhand before, those like side scrolling beat em up games, mm-hmm. it looks incredible and I cannot wait to talk to those boys. It's very exciting. Very, very exciting. Well, that's it, folks. Thank you, Gonsal. Thank you, Andy. This has been the Dual Screens Podcast. I am Stephen Fontana. Take care, and as always, please be excellent to each other. <laughs>